stuff. Okay, for example, if you are coming to me for five lakhs and idea looks interesting, you have a prototype, I'll give you. You don't need to actually uh, put it out on the net and then get real world customers. But if you are able to, you have a good idea, you translated that into implementation, I can see that implementation which is very good. It looks cool, uh, it's impressive. Then, yeah, I'll give you. But at the same time, you ask me for 20 lakhs. No, I won't. Or 50 lakhs, I won't give because still, then I want you to put it out there and see what real world customers are saying. So that difference is important. The money that you're asking for is very little. So this is where accelerator comes into picture. I told you, right? Typically, by 10 lakhs, they give. So you don't necessarily need to have it out there in the market. Accelerator is helping you with that funding. It could be accelerator or it could be individual. We can give that. But if you're asking big, reasonably big amount, you need to have that with the real world customer feedback. So how many of you want to do computer science? One. But how many of you want to go into clean energy? How many of you want to solve, solve real big problems of the country? Okay, what are the big problems of the country? Okay. What else? Education. Uh, education, yeah. Uh. Pollution. Pollution, yes. What else? Energy? Healthcare? Okay, any ideas around those areas? How do we go about thinking about medicine? Yeah, can we hear that? No, it, it, just I would love to hear something at this stage from you. That'll be great. I am not expecting you to solve anything. Because these are hard problems, very, very hard problems. Any thoughts? You want Mike? Anyone? Taking your take the person. Hmm? Yeah. So we talked about uh, big challenges for India and world over, of course, different, but <coughs> maybe same. So we talked about poverty, education, healthcare, energy, and everything. So, and then some of you said, we want to think about how to solve these problems. And so I'm saying, any ideas? What do you think are the challenges in these specific things that you guys talked about? Any thought process that you have on, okay, I want to solve, eradicate poverty by doing block. I want to help improve healthcare in India dramatically by doing something. So what? Any ideas that I'm asking? So what is the problem in healthcare? Let's talk about that. Okay, how much time I have? Also. So okay, what is what is the challenge? What are the challenges in healthcare in India? How is healthcare delivered in India today? Okay, how, what is the situation in a small town? What is the situation in a village? And what is the situation in a city? So those three guys, you know, not all should be come, coming from the same person. Anyone can talk with hey, any of these. In villages and smaller towns lack of distribution and in the cities, Lack of distribution, lack of, I um, mean, access. 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 Okay, so do you have any relative, family, friend in small town? No, you haven't visited any small town. No, no so, so the reason why I'm asking is, okay, what's your idea of small town? The population wise, give it any specific examples you can give in Andhra Pradesh, a small town. Uh, hmm? uh, I could give uh, Hyderabad and. Uh, Hyderabad is small town for you. No, okay. Oh, okay. Small town in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, hmm? I don't know where Andhra Pradesh is. So okay, where are you from? Uh, Andhra. Okay, what's small town in uh, UP? Andhra itself is a small town. Small town, okay. So, you are from Agra, yeah. small town. Yeah. How many hospitals are there in Agra? No, why I am asking that is question. question is, Barisa Longol, I am from Mongol. It's a small town, population of 1.5 lakhs. And but 1 lakh people come in and go. There is huge number of hospitals in a small town like Mongol. 
So that's why I asked, are you aware of that? So you go to villages, that's when the things are missing. So then the, what's happening is the surrounding villages, people populate from there, come to the small towns, typically one hour away by bus. So that's why the small towns are having a lot of private hospitals to serve the needs of these people. But many people can't afford. So then the government hospitals in the small towns defunct most of the time. Even though they get a lot of money funding everything. And so what happens is a lot of people ignore things until they become serious problems. So they basically try to take some local medicine. So they don't, they avoid going to the hospitals. That's why in India, majority of people from villages go directly for emergency care. So now we have, how, how many people heard about RMGST in Andhra Pradesh? It's an insurance scheme that is there, RMGST. So where people below poverty level, it's called BPL, below poverty level. Below poverty level, they uh, get free health care for serious issues, heart problem, things like that. So, emergency care is being taken care of. So, now they uh, buy through this health care with people below poverty level. So, now what's happening? The overall macroeconomics. What's happening is Something that can be treated with a small tablet early stage, if it's ignored, jaundice or something like that, uh, which can seriously lead towards liver problem. And then you need surgery, blah, blah, blah. If you early stage, there are a few medicines or water supply is clean and everything, a lot of these things can be prevented. So if you're spending smaller amount of money on preventive care, as a country, we are spending huge amount of money on emergency care. So that's one of the fundamental challenges. Now, the question is, is there a way you can take medicine uh, or medical help towards the place where the people live in an effective manner? This is a big challenge of the country. So you can use technology, you can use uh, distribution strategies, uh, bunch of different things you could do. You try to address this problem. And of course, anything related to healthcare and education, government will be involved. So there are enough NGOs. So how do you navigate through government challenges? How do you leverage NGOs? How do you work with pharmacy companies? How can you use the technology? I mean, we should also be solving this problem. We haven't done that. I'm just telling you. So as the next generation, so if you talk about big problem, this is one opportunity. Energy. Okay, we are always in deficit, big deficit. Industries are shutting down because of lack of energy. And again, no matter how much you produce in the next five years, that's not enough because consumption is going up. Okay, as people start becoming upwardly mobile, they start having. Previously, majority of the problem of people are in, let's say, hut. They use some uh, wicker lamp. No energy consumption. So, almost the de important sign of development is everyone gets electricity. Okay, suddenly you have big number of people got electricity. The next stage of evolution is, okay, I started moving from poverty level to middle class. I can start buying appliances. So, small refrigerator, television, most common things, a lot of people are buying. So, then so, suddenly more con consumption is increasing in households. So, this is going to be continuously a growing trend. So, energy is going to be a continuous challenge in India. So, on the other hand, solar is one resource abundantly available. Wind is the other one. So there are other technologies that you can think of. So this is a worldwide problem. These people are spending time on this. But people should be very excited to be in this field because you're making a huge difference. Genetics is another area. So like that. So I only one key takeaway I want you to take away is from this or any of this whole program is so you are incredibly fortunate to have the platform that you have. When I say platform, you have the parents who can support you. I'm assuming that 
insignificantly, I mean, uh, for your education, whether you want to do bachelor's, master's, PhD, I think they'll be able to support you. If you want to start something, they'll be able to support you. So without you worrying about where am I going to get my money, how can I get a job fast? So majority of you don't have to think about how can I get a job fast. Okay, it might be a sign of uh, thinking, oh, if I got a good job, that means I'm smart, that's there. But it's not necessary or essential. So you have to think big. You have to think about big problems. And you want, so the reason why I'm saying is you are in between 9th to 12th. So you, have, you, you haven't committed yourself to a, a bachelor's major yet. So there's a still an opportunity for you to think what major I want to take, what do I want to learn to make a difference. So entrepreneurship need not be about, okay, how do you make big bucks? It can, it can be also social entrepreneurship where the margins may not be big. It should be still profitable business. Okay, NGO model is not scalable. They can only support small number of people. Social entrepreneurship is the way to go solve these big problems where you create a scalable, profitable model to help people. So think about that. Scalable, profitable model to help people. So, so it's a business, but it's going to be incredibly satisfying with us because you are actually making difference to real world people. Uh, so think about all these sectors. It's not just about, of course, we talk about, when we talk about technology, I mean, entrepreneurship, we all think about software and computers. But there's a big wide world out there. So you should, and nobody is going to tell you to do engineering only, medicine only these days. You go for what you're passionate about, what you can, really, you can make a difference to the subject, to the major of that kind. So, I know in India it's still challenging. There are only few places where you can do non-engineering, non-medicine stuff. But there are other US, Singapore, all the other places, you have great opportunity to do some of these things. So, uh, you one uh, last question. Yeah, please. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, most of these engineering models like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates had an excellent kind of uh, expertise and uh, business account. Yeah. Uh, so what, what, what is some of the advice you can give to our, our young audience here about how they can develop business acumen or how they can use their friends, family or easy networks to complement mm -hmm. the market. So business acumen, is, for example, I'll just give you a couple, uh, two examples. Bill Gates, right? So we all think Windows is what is uh, where all the bet happens. Of course, Windows is the most important part. But he realized very, very early that applications are the ones which drive operating system sale. So Office is the most important business for Microsoft or more and more than Windows. So if, because end of the day, what, people want the full solution. What am I going to do with the PC and OS? Because I need something to use on it, right? So that is the most insight, mm -hmm. right? So as a business leader, so Steve Jobs, of course, put together this new magic masala of device and the complete experience around this device, which many people shied away from that model for a long, long time. So by the same Steve Jobs failed on next computers. Okay, he had a tough time on that one. So it's not like we have Sabir Bhatia, and how many people know Sabir Bhatia, the Hotmail creator. After the uh, either he lucked out or whatever it is, he sold Hotmail for four hundred million dollars to Microsoft. After that, he tried so many things. Everything is paid. Okay. So it doesn't mean that okay, one individual always going to have successful things, one or one after another. So but end of the day, uh, the business acumen means whatever it is, is okay, uh, what is the problem I'm solving? How, how uniquely I'm solving that? Okay, and and what is the stickiness? Okay, how can I make my product, my offering, sticky with the consumers? So that the switching costs are high. No matter what you pick, even the latest uh, technology products, stickiness is the most important. Facebook is incredible stickiness. Why would I, why, why am I not going to Google Plus? Because I can't 
pull all my network releases. And I am nothing, I will be bored without my network. So you have to figure out okay, how do I create this stickiness to use my products. Okay? And then um, obviously, as I said, it's not about thinking next year. It uh, should be at least five year outlook you should have where I'm going to go. Then of course, the whole what's the revenue model, how do you everything pricing strategy, all that stuff. So I don't it can be boring for you, but I want to give one example. So Microsoft uh, well, the office office story I'll tell you. Office about ninety four, up to ninety four used to be Word separately sold, Excel separately sold, PowerPoint separately sold. So they each one they had their own marketing team, or uh, maybe from shared marketing, whatever it is. But you are trying to go to the customer and say, buy Word, buy Excel, buy PowerPoint. So some customers are like, I need only Word, I don't need other ones. Okay, so now, your sales cycling is repeating. You are trying to sell from say, same office group, each product separately. Then somebody came with a brilliant idea. They said, okay, <coughs> let's put a bundle, market it as a single product. Okay, so if it's each individual unit still they're making it available. Okay, let's say fifty dollars worth, fifty dollars Excel, whatever it is. But this whole bundle, if you buy, it's only seventy five dollars. So human psyche is, I don't know whether I need it today, but let me take it anyway because I'm getting four for seventy five dollars instead of buying one. So they take it. So I'm dramatically reducing my cost of sales, and I'm increasing my revenue. So this is a brilliant marketing strategy that I started. Then next one, a similar one, uh, which is you, let's say you sell to one customer or 100 customers, and it used to be yearly license. Okay, I go sell, so let's say I make 100 crores revenue this year. Uh, then next year to make the expectation of a ma Wall Street or anybody to grow the business, revenue. Every year you're supposed to have more and more revenue. So next year to make 110 crores, I need to go back to all the customers to who I sold before and resell again. Means just get barely to 100 crores, then find more customers. See how painful this whole sales cycle is. So then they came up with this new idea called Enterprise agreement. So I said to somebody and say, pay the money for three years. So you pay the money for three years, and I give all the pay free during that time. Okay, and uh, again same bundle strategy. If one year worth of software license is fifty dollars for three years, give me seventy dollars. So you will be looking at okay, three years I would have paid one fifty dollars for seventy dollars. I'm getting assurance uh, this, this guy, so you don't need to worry. That again is the most powerful thing. Then I go to 100 customers first year. The same customer I don't need to touch next year. I can go after new customers second year and third year. So if somebody stays with you for three years, during which you are giving updates and keeping that person happy, reselling to those guys is very easy. That's another advantage. So these are some of the interesting uh, marketing, sales, strategies, or tactics that you need to think about uh, to build a business. Okay. So, so did you guys come on your own, or did your parents force you to this class? Okay. <laughs> All right. Good luck. Thank you. So, uh, just thanks, Vini, for spending most valuable time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To learn something new, there's a book here. So uh, the next program is you have a tour of the facility, but before that you fuel yourself. There's some refreshments, <clears throat> something like that in the next room. So go have some water, some refreshments, and then we'll have the tour of the facility. There is a uh, uh, two-gen, uh, three-gen is, is here. I mean, Sreejan, can you raise your hand? So. He is the manager here who actually can give you a quick tour. Some of us will also follow you. So it will show you various parts of the incubation center. Then we'll come back to this same room and uh, Srinivas Kollapara, who is the uh, COO of this facility, 
we'll also be talking about other aspects of raising funds and so on and so forth. Okay? So take a break. Thank you. I'm going to go into it in much detail, but I'm just going to say about you know, how those things affect you as a startup. Um, so the income statement is, uh, it, it really is just a, a reflection of what is going on between two time zones. So it could be you know, a day long, it could be a year long, it could be anything like that. Um, whereas a balance sheet is you know, a moment in time. It's where do you stand today? So I'm actually not going to talk theory, I'm going to take an example. How many people here know Research in Motion? Yes. Exactly. It used to be before BlackBerry. This was a year ago when their balance sheet still looked fairly healthy, as you can tell. Um, so I'm going to go through. Th this is just something I picked up uh, from a newspaper. So you know you can find these anywhere. I'm just going through them line by line and explain you know what they are and why they're relevant. So revenue. Obviously, that's the money that uh, you get you know in a company. Can anyone tell me what the revenue for uh, uh, BlackBerry would be? How would they generate the revenue? Selling phones. Selling phones. Yeah. Right? Obviously. Selling shares. Shares, yes, but that wouldn't come into revenue, actually. So revenue is always your core business. What it is that you are out to do, that will come somewhere else, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Cost of sales, obviously. So what would the cost of sales be for BlackBerry? Mobile phones? But what's their cost of sales? Go ahead. Manufacturing. Yeah. Parts, manufacturing. Anything else? Marketing? No. Marketing doesn't go there actually. It'll go somewhere else, but and we'll talk about that. There's another very big head. Shipping? Shipping? No. Manpower. The people who build the phone. There's a lot of people working on this stuff, right? I mean, so BlackBerry, probably it's not as big a thing, but let's say Ernst & Young, a service company. Their biggest head in uh, cost of sales is their manpower. And of course, gross margin. Now, if you take a look, um, I've noted down you know, some of the ratios of gross margins. So for BlackBerry, it's 36%. Uh, why do you think LinkedIn's gross margin is so high? Less manpower? Less manpower? Absolutely. They, they hardly have to pay much, right, for, for building their platform, whereas Toyota, obviously, is the opposite. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. You can't tell anything just from that. But, you know, it helps to look at it. Now, here you come to the business costs that are not related to producing goods. And this is some of the stuff that you guys are pointing at, right? Taxes. Well, taxes has a separate header at the bottom. But it's the things that we mentioned down here, which is your uh, research, right? If you're in an IT company, if you're in a typical manufacturing company, it's probably not as important. But in technology, you've got to be spending on R&D, otherwise, you know, you're going to have a phone that no one's going to buy after two years. Then you have your selling, general, and administrative expenses. Now, this is where your advertising goes, um, you know, all the other stuff that's not related to your core business. And then amortization. Now, does anyone know what that is? Basically what that means, it's a fancy word that just means uh, whenever you buy something big, you will break it up over a period of time, so you, maybe over three years, um, and each year you'll, you'll take a certain cost on it. So your depreciation goes in there. You know, if you buy a new car today and want to sell it tomorrow, would you be able to get the same amount that you paid for it? No, right? you lose a certain amount. So that, that also goes into there. Now, tell me where you think investment income could come from. Shares? Who said that? Shares, yep, yeah, that, that's one place. So a lot of these guys have, you know, cash in the bank. And with that cash, they invest in various things and, you know, they get a serious amount of income. Does anybody know, for example, how much Apple has in the bank, in cash? One hundred and three billion dollars. So you can imagine how much they're earning on, you know, their investments with that as well. And of course, taxes. 
So this gives you a, you know, a snapshot of where a company lies, if you can just examine this. And these are easily available for any company, so before you invest, just look at these basic figures first. And of course, your profit, the most important number for everyone. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take a, um, an example. How many people have heard the term, cash is king? Has anyone heard the term, cash is king? So there's a, there, there is a, a phrase, cash is king. Daddy is king. Daddy is king. <laughs> so I'm going to actually show you why cash is really, really important. Okay? And this is the cash flow. So imagine that I've got a solar company. And the cost of manufacturing my panel is $50. And I'm selling it to everybody else at 100 Sounds like a great business, right? Making, you know, double the money. Now, this is my projection. Looks amazing. I mean, look at that curve. In the first, in February, I'm going to be selling 50 units at $100 a unit, then 150 all the way up till the end of the year, 3,500 units, where I'm going to be making $350,000. Doesn't this look great? Wouldn't everybody love to have a business like this? It gets complex when you start looking at cash flows. So, let me give you an example. So, this is my monthly income statement, right? You have your revenue. Each of these is basically the numbers that we said earlier, multiplied by the 100. Um, and your cost of sales is the multiplied by the 50. So, this is your standard operating expenses. First month, obviously, you're going to be spending even though you haven't sold anything yet, right? So, you're starting off negative, And it looks good. Right? You're going to be making a decent amount of money. So, why is this a problem? Let me show you. So, I have $25,000, right, that I'm starting my business with on day one. Seems like it should be enough. Now, the problem with this is, if you're a startup and you're just doing a new business, you need to buy components to build whatever you're building. People aren't going to trust you, right? If, you buy, if I buy some component from you, you're going to want cash up front. And typically, there's a delay as they deliver that product to you. So, you know, let's say it's a month for this case. Now, at the same time, when I'm selling the product to somebody in a corporate situation, typically they want a month's credit. So, I have to deliver today, but I won't get paid for a month. This is very, very standard, and actually in larger companies, it's more, it, you know, they can um, delay your payments up to 90 days. But let's just take this example. So, I am spending my first $2,500 straight away, right? My thousand also is going. So, three and a half thousand dollars is going out of my twenty-five thousand. I'm fine. Twenty-one thousand five hundred is left. Looks good, right? Now the problem is February again. I'm not going to make any money because I bought my stuff in January. It'll arrive in February and I'll sell it. I won't get paid till March. So let's go on and see what happens now. So my seven and a half thousand that I've spent is now going over here. I've only got thirteen thousand left. I think you guys can see where this is going, right? So finally, I get my money that I, brought, that I sold over here. The problem is, I'm now spending $12,500 to build my next batch. And all of a sudden, I only have $4,500 left. It's not looking good. And there we go. I'm actually already bankrupt. <laughs> I'm 1500 in all. I don't have it, so... There are many cases where companies haven't done their uh, cash flows. They have great businesses, everything looks good, and yet they can't do it. But if you continue to look, you'll see another thing. Can you notice something else over here? It's actually going down. Can you see that? So if I actually had the extra $5,000, I'd have $30,000 to start with, I would have been fine. If I raise that up front. Now there's other things you can do apart from you know, raising extra cash. What else could you do, do you think, uh, to stop this situation from happening? Anyone have any ideas? If income is delayed, then delay the payments. You could do that, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. What else? Anyone? 
Anyone else have any ideas? Take a loan? Yeah. So yeah, obviously you, you could raise the extra money, right? But there's many things you can do. For example, what the, the issue you're, you're ha actually having is because, funnily enough, you're selling too much. So maybe you tell people, you know, you want 100 units, I can only give you 50. Now that's not something that any owner wants to do, right? You don't want to turn away, but sometimes you just have to do it. So, watch your cash flows. <laughs> you really need to do it. So, your balance sheet. I'm going to say, basically it's a snapshot in time. If you take a look, you'll actually be able to see some similarities, right, between the two. Your revenue actually goes over here as accounts receivable. Can anyone tell me why? It's because I told you before, right, but you're not actually going to get that revenue straight away. You're going to book it, but they're going to pay you next month. So it's something that you will receive in the future. And of course, your ending cash goes into your assets. Now, another rule of thumb typically that is the higher up something is, the better it is for you, the more you can count on it. So this stuff is the, probably the stuff you're definitely going to get. Um, whereas if you look further down, I mean, you're building your equipment. If you needed to liquidate that, a lot of times you're not going to get what you want out of it. So that's just a really brief um, snapshot of finances. But I, I just wanted to go into funding. I know that a lot of it was covered by um, Sri before me, but I wasn't sure if everything was covered in a way that you really got it fully. Um, so I just go through it really quickly, and I'm hoping that you'll have lots of questions for me. But um, you basically have two types of finance, equity and debt. Uh, funnily enough, I mean, so, do you guys get what equity is and what debt is? Does anybody not get it? Okay. <laughs> so in equity, like they say, you have a company um, that you believe is going to make money in the future. What you do is you sell shares in your company. You divide up your company into multiple shares. Right? You say, okay, I'll split them to 100 equal parts, and I will sell you 10 parts of it. Now, the valuation is a whole separate thing, but you, you value it in some way. So. It's great for me as an entrepreneur because I'm not putting cash out up front. Um, it's great for the business person, I mean for the person buying it, if he believes in you. Because it, in theory it could be worth a lot more. Now debt, of course, is where you take money from a bank or from some other person and you pay interest on it. The bad thing about that for a startup is it has to be paid every month. You know, and sometimes you just don't have it, right? Which of those two do you think is the most expensive? <coughs> Debt? Why? Why? It would seem like that, right? At first, if you looked at it. I guess equity finance would be more expensive because we have to give out different payments to that, that's lost. Yeah, that's definitely true. Equity is uh, more expensive because in bank loans you can pay in installments, so you don't have to like pay everything at once. Just yeah, pay that's also true. But basically, I mean, on, a, on debt, you're typically paying what 10, 12, 15 percent. Um, imagine that your business was what I showed you earlier, right? Imagine this is your business. I go all the way back. So if I'm making this kind of money and I'm giving 10% of that away, that's a lot more expensive than the interest rate, right? So actually, for an entrepreneur who really believes in his business um, and who can support it, debt is always better. Now having said that, virtually no startup starts with debt. Why is that? Banks were in finance. Absolutely. No, no bank is going to fund a startup. Um, he wants to see a running business, or he wants to see collateral land or something that you're going to mortgage and put against, and startups just don't have that.
So like I say, their financing is not available typically to young startups, and that's what they require. So you heard uh, Sunni talking about the different uh, you know, levels of equity funding. So typically, this is the timeline that it goes by. You have your founders first, that's you and whoever else you started with. Whatever savings you have, whatever you can scrape up, that's what you'll, you'll do. Then of course you have your family and friends, hopefully. You try and pull them in. And usually you want to you know, wait till your ideas got off the ground a little bit so you can sell them on that. Then come the angels. And these are going up in terms of uh, amounts of money also. So you, you will be able to raise, you know, typically with that friends and family, you're talking in a couple of lakhs. With angels, you're typically talking between a minimum of 10 and up to about 50. And then venture capitalists, 50 up. Um, and then, of course, you're hoping to be acquired. Uh, so this is just a, um, a summary of the different steps that we're talking about. So when you're bootstrapping, which is a, have you guys heard the term bootstrapping? It basically means, you know, you are just tightening your belt, you're eating once a day if you have to, you do whatever it takes to keep your business going. Um, then like I said, you go to your friends and your family. Now the step that I missed out is exactly where we are today, which is the incubator accelerator step. These are picking up um, around the world and in India as well. So Triple IT Hyderabad, um, the place that you just visited, right? As we said, there also we invest in companies. It's typically between five and 20 lakhs. Um, and it, more than the money, you're getting the mentoring and the coaching and you're in an environment you know, with a bunch of other people also doing startups. Um, I'll talk a little more about that afterwards. Um, we have about uh, six start, um, incubators in Hyderabad, I think. Accelerators and incubators both. Then you go to your angels and networks. The two big ones in Hyderabad are the Hyderabad Angels and the Indian Angel Network. Hyderabad Angels are actually quite a bit bigger than Hyderabad. Um, now those guys are typically, um, I think he explained it, but I wasn't in the room, so I'll explain it again. <laughs> the angels are typically uh, high net worth individuals who um, decide that I made my money in a certain way, I want to take a risk with other people. So they're funding um, startups they believe in. And they sometimes band together, like Hyderabad Angels is a group of about 50 um, uh, angels right now. And they all get together and they decide who they're going to invest in. Now above that is your venture capital, which is a much bigger thing. Those guys, <laughs> so there are a lot of nicknames for venture capital. Um, most of them very derogatory, vulture capital, all sorts of things, because they, those guys really want their returns uh, to be much larger than anybody else, and they'll do anything they can to get it. Um, they typically want you know, controlling uh, stake in your company, it's very common for them to ask you to step down and ask somebody else to take over for you and you know, things like that. But what they bring to the table, um, you're not going to get with any of the other guys. These guys are typically people who are super connected um, across the world. So they can open doors that you will never get through yourself. So why an incubator or an accelerator? As it shows, in the, in the old model, all it was was you'd invest you know, in a company, give them some money and hope that they know what they're doing. Now what we do is we actually do all of the above. You give the money as well, but you're also giving space, as you saw, you know, if you're a larger company, you get a room downstairs or you get to work out with the space here. And we create mentors that work with you. So whatever, um, whatever is missing as a skill set in your company, we plug that gap. Uh, so. So what we found is that really makes a difference. Uh, this is typically how it works. Now this is more accelerated, that's why it's a shorter duration, but basically what we do is, we get companies every day coming to us saying, you know what, we'd love to be incubated by you guys. Um, how do we get it? So what we do is we ask them to fill out a form, tell us what their ideas are, uh, give us the team background, give us the uh, financials, all of that stuff. And then we evaluate them across multiple criteria and we decide which of them we're going to, to select. And once they do, they get the money, they get the space, and then we start engaging with them you know, on their skills and what they're lacking. Duration, three to 12 months, the shorter periods are what are called accelerators. And the longer periods are incubators, typically. 
Does anybody know what an accelerator is and what the difference is between an accelerator and an incubator? So typically, accelerators um, are much shorter, shorter in duration. They're between three and six months. They are usually for companies that uh, don't require much capital. So red companies, for example, are ideal. Um, the reason is that you can get on the ground, just focus on your business idea, and you're put through a, um, like a course almost, a series of educational events that you have to go through, which is basically polishing you to the point where you get to the VC funding very quickly. So within three to six months, you will be pushed out, and you'll get funding. That's the idea. Um, we don't do that here at IIIT. Most of the companies that we sponsor are product companies that require um, more investment and more time. So it, it doesn't really work for us, the incubator model, uh, the accelerator model, sorry. So just a little about us. You've, you've already seen the space, but uh, we have, you know, 8,000 square feet downstairs. And I don't know if he told you, but uh, all of the companies in that space are companies that we have funded. Upstairs um, is the co-working space uh, where people rent and buy the desk. Did we explain to you why that's beneficial? Or does anybody know why you would want to be in a co-working space? Apart from the cheap desk, of course. Any ideas? Well, typically, when company, most people who start um, a company have come from some other corporate background where they've been working somewhere, they've always had colleagues around them. This is one reason. Um, all of a sudden they're working out of their house with maybe one other person. It can get lonely. So having people around you who are you know, really focused on the startup experience makes a difference. And also, whatever problem you have, there's probably somebody else in the space who's already solved it. You guys can leverage each other you know, for knowledge and experience. So it really helps to be in a co-working space. And of course, the other part of it is just logistics. If I'm two people or three people, I don't want to be opening an office and having the maid come and clean it and making sure the internet's working and, you know, all, all that stuff is taken care of there. You don't need to bother. You just go and build your product. We have over 45 companies on site, 12 companies funded, six have graduated, and five of those are doing really well. The last one I think is really interesting, and it's a testament to the guys who came before me. Um, every single company that we funded raised 11 rupees for every rupee. So if we invested 10 lakhs in them, they raised 1.1 gross straight afterwards. Um, I think that means that these guys have done a great job. So this is typically what you get for incubation services. You get help with technology transfer, if you have a, a technology that you want to give out to other people, uh, which is very common. Um, you get help with licensing of your technologies. Very often what you find is that you build something, you don't want to take it all the way to product stage, and you just license it to a larger company, get some money, you know, focus on something else. You get the mentorship, the domain and business expertise, etc. And the access to international channel partners. One of the advantages we have is because we are, you know, an incubator with 50 companies under us, a lot of international companies come to us and say, we want to partner with you and your startups. So we pass those benefits on that you wouldn't get if you were just doing a startup on your own. And that's it for my presentation. So, questions, anyone? Uh, so where do venture capitalists uh, get their money from? Like, their 50 crores? So venture capitalists typically um, raise money. So, so a lot of these guys have, have a major backing. They're, they're people who've done this for a long time. So they go out and they tell, they have a network of investors. Um, so they go out and say, okay, we're raising a fund. Uh, you, usually it's based on their track record. So for example, Sequoia, right? They've backed Google, they've backed a whole bunch of amazing companies. So when they go out and they say, you know what, we want to raise another fund, and they don't raise in the millions of dollars, they raise in the hundreds of millions only, typically, even billions sometimes. Um, but yeah, anybody who has money says, so if you need money, please take it, because your returns are going to be high. So they're basically raising from other high, high net worth individuals. Good question. 
So, um, so incubators, there are typically two types of incubators um, that exist, right? There's, um, there are the purely profit-oriented incubators. And what they do is they take, they, they, they uh, calculate approximately how many companies they think will be successful, right? So you know typically it's one in 10 companies will make it. So you fund 10 companies, hoping that the 10 will make it big. What you do is you give them the money and in return you take equity in the company. And when that company exits, you've made your money, right? We are not um, a for-profit organization. We're a non-profit here. Yeah. So what we do is slightly different. Um, we get grants from the government. The government wants to encourage startups. So, you know, they give us a crore and say, go give it out to people. So we decide, okay, a crore means 10 companies get 10 lakhs each. And we find those 10 and we give it out. And when they exit, the money comes back and we invest that again to other companies. So we also do that. Basically, we take equity. Ours, uh, typically, with what we do is, for about 20 lakhs, we take about 8% of the company. Typically. That's how it works. Anyone else? So, uh, okay. I have one question. So, when, a, when one of our young entrepreneurs, whenever it's the right time, they want to start their companies, so what is the process they need to follow to to be incubated here at Triple IT? Yeah, so, um, as I was saying, what, what we do is we, we announce it in a couple of different places um, that we're looking for fund, uh, we're looking for startups to fund. Right now, for example, we don't have any money. We've, uh, we've given it all out. The next batch will come in January. So probably around December, we'll make announcements in multiple locations that we're looking. You'll be able to apply. What if you get a company that um, wants to be incubated? It's really, really good that you don't have money to incubate a company. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, if we don't have the money, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that, right? Uh, it's it's actually fairly rare. Most companies do plan well enough in advance. To, they, I mean, they know that it's not going to come quickly. Uh, if we really think they're good um, and we don't have the money, we pass them on to somebody else. You know, one of the things that I've personally been doing is I'm trying to make sure that uh, all of the different incubators um, and all of the people involved in the startup world are connected. Because we're all trying to make um, the startup scene you know, more vibrant. And until now, it's been lots of individual things. So for example, Bits Palani, uh, the head of the Bits Palani incubator, the head of the Thai incubator, we talk almost every couple of days. So I, I just pass it on. And we, have, we also, uh, the other thing is that incubators typically, um, they focus on a specific segment. So we do technology companies, right? Product, uh, we don't do e-commerce typically. Uh, the Bits Palani incubator is really good at the healthcare um, and the clean tech. Uh, so, you know, we kind of know where it's going, so they refer people to us, we refer them to them. We make sure they get funding somehow. Yeah, hmm. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Today and also for the first speech. Thank you very much. a virtual environment where we are going to create a real life situation. So just imagine, we heard a little about finance, we heard marketing, we heard R&D, we know production, so we know all about, at least a little all about this. So we've heard about trees. Here we are going to enter a forest. That is what the simulation is all about. A few industries that use simulation which possibly you will be aware about is aviation. Can you imagine a pilot flying a plane who may have been through all the trainings, who may know the complete theory about flying and aviation, but hasn't been through a simulator? I would like a show of hands of some, uh, what does the simulator actually do? What are we addressing? Why go through all this? 
Let's take the case of aviation. Why would you like to put a pilot in a simulation? Just imagine, just try and understand and let's, yes please. Uh, so you could make an experience uh, situations which cannot, which could be dangerous to be recreated. Wonderful. Uh, I mean you would hate a pilot in that aircraft if he doesn't know how, if he doesn't have the skill set to respond at that instant. He's not going to have a time, you know, uh, he's not going to have a time to, um, to ponder over the problem. He needs to have instinctive reaction. So we are addressing skill sets. Business simulation is something very, very akin to that. Can you recognize what this is? Any of you, can you recognize it was possibly made before you were born? In fact, definitely before you were born. Can you recognize what this is? Anybody, just take a wild guess. Projector. Sorry? Projector. Projector. Yes? Computer. Okay, anybody else? Camera. Wonderful, it's a camera. Who manufactured this? There were pioneers, Kodak was pioneers in the, in the photography field. Now, I'm sure you will recognize this. Everybody knows it's a camera, right? Now, who manufactured this? Take a wild guess. Just look very carefully at that picture. Who manufactured this? Kodak. Sorry? Kodak. Kodak. How many of you think it's Kodak? It's written on that. Plenty of us do think it's Kodak, but you'll be surprised to know Kodak didn't. They only marketed the product. It was Flextronics who manufa manufactured this product and it was Kodak who man marketed this product. I would like to trigger your um, thought process a little more. Do you think business is all about giving day after day a better product at a cheaper price? Do you think it is that? Think about computers, think about your cell phones, think about that. And yet here's a contradiction. You give a better product at a cheaper price while increasing or retaining your profits. I would just like you to think about that. Another thought process, business is all about disruption. Do you agree with that? Here's a take on this. Have you heard of Britannica? I'm sorry, yeah, Britannica. No, probably your parents or grandparents, you know, there was a series, volumes of books, which gave a whole lot of information on diverse topics. And at that time, it used to be a matter of, you know, pride. We used to display it possibly in our drawing rooms or study rooms that we do own these Britannicas. This graduated onto Encarters. Encarters, have you heard of? By Microsoft. They had series of similar kind of information. Which grad Wikipedia, I'm sure all of you would have heard of. Right? It went on to Wikipedia. Now, everything, do you see how the business is getting disrupted? <coughs> what next? We don't know. In fact, what does Google do? It talks about, I mean, it, it's a business where you spend money to offer a service free. There are various models which it adopts. And do you know what Britannica talks about Wikipedia? It says that it is a public toilet where you do not know who has used it before you. <coughs> Three rules. Please break them. Necessity is the mother of invention. Invention is the mother of necessity. Change management. You do not manage change. Create the change that you want to come. Do not keep all your eggs in one basket. Please do keep your eggs in one basket. Improve on your core competence. Polish your gold. Stop worrying about the bride, uh, about your brass. This is not what I am saying. This was said by Jeff Immelt, Chairman and CEO of GE. This is what he feels about entrepreneurs. He does believe that the right hand side columns need to be focused on. <coughs> what we are doing here is giving you a window to a simulation platform called Foundation. It is very, very basic, but it will give you an understanding of how to understand, cross-functional understanding of the various attributes that business goes to, uh, that is required to run any business. Now, why simulate? Why do we give a simulation platform? I think that was very, very well answered. It is on a risk-free platform. You view alternative strategies. 
You can play around with this. It is basically a business game. You are playing around with this and seeing the outcome of your decisions. Very rarely do you get an opportunity to take decisions and then see the outcome of your decisions. You do have other ways of learning. You have case studies. Have you heard about case studies? Have you heard about role plays? Have we? Yes, we have. But everything is in hindsight. It is important, certainly it is. But a simulation will give you an, a platform where you evaluate your decision-making abilities. You take accountability of your decisions. That is what a simulation gives very, very, very well. Now, it bridges the knowing-doing gap. Here we spoke, in fact, when the session on finance was going on, lots of people had a few inputs to give. They spoke about what finance is, the three, in fact, we just spoke about income statement, balance sheet. Um, there was a little know-how about it, but how do you implement it? You start your business. What do you need to see in all this? How do you generate cash? How do you know that your model is an implementable model? It's a viable idea. <coughs> From expert managers, we are looking at building business leaders and strategists. It is often said it's okay if you're unfit. You don't know something, it's fine. You can always learn something. You can always you know, go to Google and search out things. You can always get informed. The problem is if you become a misfit, then you don't fit in in any category. And business is certainly something where you need to look at people. You need to create value. So you definitely have a big problem if you become a misfit. Business terminology made easy. Very often we hear, hear about terminologies which are a little difficult to understand and it actually puts us away. You know, puts us at bay. We often wonder, let's not ask questions. You know, I wonder what a person will feel if we ask this question. Is, does it sound very stupid? Do we feel like that here? Do, does it sound very basic, very stupid? I don't feel like asking a question. And you nudge your neighbor or you say, leave it. We'll find out. Do you feel that way? Anybody here? If you do, well, here is a simulation which will handhold you. Nothing is stupid on this platform. There was a professor at IIT, uh, at IIM, sorry, IIM Ahmedabad, who was teaching marketing. And he saw the class not so receptive to his terminology, you know, the various terminologies. Marketing, actually, people thought it's just about the gift of the gap. Of the gap. Well, of course, we know marketing. But when he started his session, the reception he got was not so good. You know, the participation from the class that he expected was not so full. So this is how he went about it. He said, now let's imagine Mr. Murli. He goes to a party. And he sees a beautiful young girl there. He walks up to the girl, says, I'm rich. Will you marry me? She says, yes, that's a direct mark. Mr. Murli goes to a party. He sees a beautiful young girl. But his friend walks up to the girl and says, you see that? That's Mr. Murli. He's rich. Will you marry him? This is advertising. Mr. Murli goes to a party. And he walks up to a girl, takes her telephone number. He comes home, gives her a call, and says, listen, I'm rich. Will you marry me? That's telemarketing. Mr. Murli goes to a party and he sees this beautiful girl. He picks up her bag for her, pulls a seat for her, makes her sit on the seat, gets her a drink from outside. She drops a little drink, he brings a napkin, helps her wipe that area. Now when she gets up, he's there to pick up his ba her bag, open the door for her, take her out and then says, I'll drive you home. That's public relations. Mr. Murli walks into a party. And this girl sees him and she runs up to him and says, Yo, Mr. Murli, I know you're rich. Will you marry me? That's grand revelation. <laughs> now, Mr. Murli goes to a party, but his friend, this time not Mr. Murli, his friend goes to this girl and he is really shouting praises on her and he says, at the end of it, he says, I'm rich. Will you marry him? Will you marry me? She gives him a slap on his face. That's customer feedback. <laughs> now, Mr. Murli goes to a party and he walks up to this girl and says, I'm rich, will you marry me? 
but she introduces him to her husband. That's the demand and supply gap. <laughs> Mr. Murli goes to a party 